A very good evening, a good morning to all of you who are joining us for this session called the Next Genius Research Symposium in collaboration with Lumiere Education. Uh, uh, and from Lumiere, we have Dhruva Bhatt, uh, who's directors at Lumiere, uh, who's joined us uh, for this session and is going to share with us information about research and about how to conduct research. So to all the students who have joined us here today, uh, we're delighted to have you all here and there are some educators as well. So thank you for joining. Uh, this is a two hour session and uh, the first hour roughly is going to be about general aspects of research, about how to conduct research. Uh, and then uh, towards the end, uh, we'll have topic specific breakout rooms where you can join a breakout room of top for the topic of your interest uh, and uh, you know learn from researchers and professors who have joined us for this session uh, uh, i would request all of you to keep yourself on mute please because this is a meeting so that is one thing uh, it would be great if you could do that and before moving forward let me just quickly share my screen and uh, share show you the schedule for this evening or the next couple of hours so this is what right now, it's the opening session or opening segment where uh, I'm presenting along with Dhruva. Following this, you will listen to Dhruva as he shares about how, what's the importance of research in solving real world problems and how research helps build your profile. Uh, that will be followed by a, a workshop where Dhruva will share some profiles and show you how to create your own research proposal. And that is followed by, of course, the Zoom breakout rooms where you will meet uh, uh, researchers, professors from all these fields. So we have uh, a computer science uh, a researcher, someone from physics, humanities, law, economics, environment and sustainability, engineering, uh, pre-medical and marketing. So all these uh, researchers and professors and experts are going to share about their research with you, going to share their research journey with you. They're going to talk to you about why, what got them interested into research, uh, what is their research topic, how did they conduct their research and things like that. So it's going to be a, a, a fantastic and engaging session because in the breakout rooms, we expect that there will be fewer students. So that would mean that you would have really have the opportunity to ask questions on a one-on-one -on -one, uh, basis. So take make the best of this opportunity, uh, ask questions, engage, and yeah, uh, enjoy the session. That, that's all I would say. With that, uh, let me pass it on to Dhruva. Uh, Dhruva, it's a pleasure to have you here. And uh, thank you for joining this session. Uh, before we go ahead, let me introduce Dhruva. Dhruva is the director of Lumiere Research Scholar Program and a PhD candidate at Oxford's Department of International Development. Before this, he graduated from Harvard with an undergraduate degree in economics and from Harvard with an MPhil in Development Studies as a Rhodes Scholar. So thank you so much, Dhruva. Uh, it, it's a pleasure to have you here. Over to you now. Hi, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here. And Devesh, thank you for putting this all together. Um, over the next hour or so, a um, little under an hour, we'll be doing a couple of different things. We'll be talking about what is research? We'll be asking, why is research important, both for the world and for yourself? I'll be telling you a little bit about Lumiere and what we do. And then we're going to dive into what is a research question, what's a research proposal, and how do you write a really good research question and research proposal. Along the way, I will be asking for you guys to put things in the chat. So it's super important that you have your keyboards out and ready and, and are excited to participate, because otherwise this will be a very boring session that I'm just speaking at you for the entire time. And we're going to kick that off with an activity just to make sure that you're all awake and here. I'm gonna ask what's an area in which you might be interested in doing research? If, if I put a gun to your head and said, uh, do research right now, what would it be in? Please put your answers in the chat. Yeah. Um, 
Devish, is it possible for them to respond to the whole group? How do I see their answers? Yes, now they can. Feel free to use the chat feature. Yeah. Great, environment, CS, sustainable energy, chemistry, non-conventional energy, astrobiology, humanities and social issues, marketing. Um, I am not sure what law of the sea is, but, but something about law, uh, CS, theoretical physics, marketing, the humanities, astronomy, medicine, uh, astrophysics, a lot of physics, some more physics. Um, I see an economics there, which is great to see uh, medicine and medicine particularly with respect to veterinary medicine. Uh, I see a bunch of engineering. Uh, I see another psychology. So this is such a cool set of interests. And honestly, some of those terms, I had no idea what they meant when I was in high school. So you guys are already doing very well for yourselves. Uh, and a very fair question to ask is what brings all of these fields together? What does it mean to say you're doing research when you could be doing work in fields as varied as social issues, to psychology, to law, to engineering, all the way through to genetics and medicine. And I think that's a very fair question. It's something that we've spent a fair bit of time thinking about. And to me, the idea of research is trying to follow a very clear and systematic process to try and create a tiny piece of new knowledge about the world that helps us move human understanding of the world just a little bit better. And it follows a four step process and it begins with identifying something that you find confusing or interesting, something that you're curious about that you find yourself thinking about now and then. And this could be something in your own body. It could be something in the world around you. It could be something in outer space. Uh, it could be really anything you read in the news or, or that you see in politics and the economy around you. And once you've identified something confusing or, or interesting, the next step is to dig deep into that. And the reason you want to do that is because let's say an apple falls in my head and I decide to spend the next many years of my life doing research on this apple and I discover this cool new thing called gravity. I, I suspect none of you would be very impressed with all of my work because we, gravity has been discovered already and we know a lot about it. And you, so you don't want to recreate the work that other people have done. Rather, you want to build on the work that other people have done. So the first step then is to know what have other people said about this topic before? What have previous researchers written about it? What have they discovered about it? And once you've read that and you've become a real expert on the topic, that's when the research process actually begins. Many people think that the reading itself is the research. But once you've done some of the reading and understood the background to your topic, you then have a much better sense of what is still left, what are the holes, what do we still not fully understand about this topic. And that's when you're able to frame a research question that, you're, that is much clearer and that actually fills a hole in, the, in human knowledge. And once you've identified that research question, you then need to do your own analysis. And this could be analysis of quantitative numerical data, it could be analysis of qualitative data, which means texts and poems and music and stories and, and interviews. It could be a lab experiment, or it could even just be things on your computer, simulations and pieces of code that you write. All of that could be ways of answering that research question and discovering something new that helps us understand the world a bit better. And if you thought that that's when it ended, it's actually where one of the hardest parts then starts. And that's the final section, which is taking this thing that you've discovered and communicating it to the outside world. So writing it up in a way that makes sense, that provides all of the context necessary and makes it very clear what the relevance and importance of your uh, findings are. And to then try and use that research that you've done to change people's minds, to talk about it in conferences, to go and publish it in academic books or journals, to try and get it into newspapers or, or um, new shows on TV so that people in the real world outside of the university bubble will hear about your research and will understand what it means for them. So that's the process of research, starting with a vague idea, developing it and identifying a clear research question, answering that research question and then writing up your, your solution or your discovery and communicating it out into the world.
And so that's the process where I want to focus and zoom in for the rest of this session on two parts, which is how to frame a good research question and then how to write a research proposal. But before that, I want to give you a bit of background so that you understand why I'm the one up here talking about this. So I think one part of what Devish mentioned is that I've been involved in research for a really long time now, both when I did my bachelor's degree in economics at Harvard, as well as now doing a PhD at Oxford. I've been involved in research for the last eight years of my life, if not more uh, than that. And for those of you who come to the economics breakout room, you'll get to hear a little bit more about the specifics of my research and what I do and, and what I've done historically. But the other part of it is also that for the last year and a bit, I've been running this research program called the Lumiere Research Scholar Program. And through that, we've had uh, a lot of students do research and it's made us think about why research is important for you. And there's two parts to this answer. The first is that it's important to the world. We've already talked about how it can help us understand the world better. But understanding the world better then means that we can help make the world a better place, that you can use the findings that you've discovered to figure out how to cure important diseases, figure out how to develop better economic systems that do um, that provide more resources to those most in need. It can help us understand our history better and help us prevent mistakes that we've made in the past. So research is incredibly important in terms of, um, of, of moving society forward, but it's also important to you when you think about your next steps, college applications, when you think about internship applications, when you think about jobs in the future. And that's because research uniquely allows you to do a couple of things. The first is that it allows you to build your profile by showcasing academic excellence, because a lot of high school students can say that they're interested in history. Very few people can, will have a 20 page paper that they can point to that, said, that, that demonstrates how deep they've dug into a subject and that uh, they have gained real expertise in the field. So when you're thinking about applying to universities, for instance, this academic um, excellence is something that they are looking for because they want to make sure that you've got what it takes to succeed in an undergraduate program. The second thing you get to do is in research, you often work in a community of researchers. And that means working with other people who are working on a similar problem, but probably also with a mentor, whether that's a teacher, a PhD student, a professor, someone that supervises your work and, and observes you and makes sure that you are on the right track. And this person can be such an incredible resource for you in the future. They can be a sounding board for questions that you have or issues that you might be facing. Uh, they can provide you with feedback on what your strengths and weaknesses are and how you can improve and, and what kinds of um, uh, paths you can pursue in the future. And of course, very explicitly, they could help recommend you for future scholarships, future uh, uh, job applications, things that you need their support for and that they can make possible for you. And so building that network is a really cool part of the research experience as well. And then finally, you, you get to develop skills that are super, super useful. So things that you might not even, um, uh, you might not associate with the research process, but things like how to overcome failure, because you will face failure over and over again in the research process where you feel like hitting your head against a wall. You learn how to read and analyze things and then write and develop your writing skills. You will figure out how to manage your time because especially if those of you in high school are doing research alongside your other activities, then you're going to mess up and you're gonna to have to figure out how to balance it all at some point. So research is a cool, fun activity that helps make the world a better place, but also makes you a better and more competitive person coming out of high school. And so I think research is super useful that way. Pause there for a second to see if there are any questions about the thing so far. Please do feel free to put them in the chat, either about what research is or about why research might be important. And if not, I will move on, but please feel free to put things in the chat as we go along. So the reason I'm here is because I run this organization that, that has worked with over 500 students on research projects where students work one-on-one -on -one with PhD students on their research papers. And we've had students do research in all sorts of fields, ranging from sustainable development uh, to, and, and you'll meet Avni if you go into the sustainable development breakout room later today, 
to uh, astrochemistry and, and how you can study space material that's hit the earth all the way through to protests and the use of visual arts in the process of protest, which is the last one there by Lynn. So really a variety of topics that students have worked with an incredible set of over 400 mentors on. And this is something that if you're interested in, please do check out our website. I'd love to tell you more about the program and about Lumiere. But that's the background with which I'm coming into the rest of this, this session, which is trying to, having spent so much time thinking about um, how to structure the research process best and how to communicate what research is to young people. Um, I think I come into the second part with a little bit of, of a background in the topic that I hope you all find useful. And so we're gonna be talking about what is a research question and how do you frame a really good research question? And then the second is, um, how do you structure a good research proposal? Before that, I see we have a few questions in the chat. So I'm just gonna to respond to those before moving on. So Unnati asks, please repeat the third point. The third point on that slide was that research helps you develop skills that can be really, really useful for you in the future. Skills like how to read and find information effectively and then communicate it really well uh, in, in a paper. Uh, it helps you understand time management and how to encounter and overcome failure among a wide variety of other skills that you develop through the research process that can set you up very well um, for university and, and job applications. The second from Aryan is, how can research help in the college application? I think it can help in a couple of ways. The first is when you're applying to colleges, especially outside of India, you do need to um, write a lot of essays explaining why you want to study at a particular college or a general essay called the common app essay for us universities and so research can be a really useful part of that where you talk about your experience with research and how it helped you understand what it is you want to study and why secondly research can also be something that you publish or that you send as part of your application so that that also shows to them uh, that this is something serious that you have done and that sets you apart academically from the others. And then finally, once you work with a mentor, you can also ask them for a recommendation letter, something that says, that allows them to say, hey, this student compares to the other students I've worked with at my university in these ways. Here are the students' strengths and here's why I think they'd be a good fit for your university. So all of those are ways that um, it helps with the college application and and I think it says a lot that, that so many students entering Ivy League universities and top universities around the world have done some sort of research in high school. Rohan asks, how do you feel research in theoretical physics can make an impact in real life? That's a great question. The last physics class I took was in 10th standard, so I don't think I'm quite the right person to respond to this. Uh, but I do think that there's, there's probably a couple of ways in which it can happen. One is that, things that start off as being theoretical can in the decades and centuries to come be proven and implemented in ways that can really benefit humanity. So even if something is theoretical right now, that doesn't mean that it has to be theoretical forever. The second is that even theoretical things can help us improve our understanding of the world. So uh, theoretical physics concept can help us understand how um, movement occurs or, or, or uh, aerodynamics or things like that, which can then help us create better systems in, in the future. So it, doesn't, it isn't, doesn't have to be the direct implementation of this theoretical paper itself, but rather the insights that you get through that can be things that help develop people's thinking and inform uh, things in the future. Arpit asks whether it's possible to do research without a mentor. It's definitely possible, but it's a lot harder. I think given that we have the internet, it is possible for you to read up on how research works, uh, get the tools like data analysis tools that you can find online on um, programs like Coursera or edX and do research yourself. But it definitely helps to have a mentor to make sure that you're on the right track, who can point you to the right places, uh, give you feedback and sort of guide you along the, the way. Um, a couple of questions, I'll, I'll then move on. Um, one student asks a very good question, which is I've tried to do research in my field, but it's affecting my studies. I don't know how to manage time on both. 
I promise you that most high school students can make time for research or for an extracurricular activity if they want to. If you think about what it would take for you to put in, say, nine hours per week into research, that's an hour a day on weekdays and two hours a day on weekends. An hour is between 7 to 8 p.m. each day you set aside for doing this activity and then two, two hours a day on the weekends. Or you could front load it onto the weekends and do three hours a day on the weekends and that's six hours that you've just found for yourself that, that you've got for other activities. And I think given that and given that research is often in your area of interest, so it's very academic, I think balancing the two hopefully shouldn't be too much of an issue for strong students. Great. Um, there are a couple of others, which maybe I will come back to this after, uh, after, after I move into the next section, before which I know that Devish has a poll that he wanted to run by all of you. Thank you so much, Truva, for sharing all that information. Uh, and all the students, I have just a couple of quick questions, uh, which I'll just put in front of you in a moment. So here's question number one. Please uh, take your time and just answer this. All right. Great. Just another five more seconds before I close the poll. OK, thank you. And I just show the results to all of you. So which grade are you in? Uh, almost one third of you are in grade 12, grade 11, grade 10, and grade 9. All right. Um, one more question, uh, which Thru already asked in the chat, but I, I'll still go ahead and ask that. Which, which is your uh, subject area that you would like to create a research proposal in? Thank you. I can see that students have started answering. Okay, I'll take a, another 10 seconds. All right, thank you for answering that. And uh, physics is quite popular, followed by computer science, environment and sustainability. Okay, great. And here is my, actually the third poll question I'll take towards the end. Fantastic, okay, thank you so much, Truva, back to you. Great, thanks guys for answering that. Uh, let's dive into it then. What is a research question? So research question is the foundation of your entire paper. So it's basically a very short and clear statement that explains what it is that you're going to be investigating through your paper. And so some examples of good research questions are, what are the mechanisms of gene editing technology that apply to cancer detection and the development of anti-cancer therapy? So this is a question which is clear if you know biology, and has and explains what it is that it is uh, and it's specific so it explains what it is that the person who is writing the paper is planning to study in that paper a potential research question from political science could be did the hong kong government's response to the student protests increase or decrease international media coverage once again it's specific to a particular situation and has a very clear question which is how did X lead to Y? And X and Y are, are defined very clearly. And similarly, from the humanities and English, a potential research question could be, how was Shakespeare's choice to invent words affected by the political and cultural background of his time? So Shakespeare, as you might know, invented a whole bunch of words in the, in the English language, which didn't exist before. And someone might study, what is the historical context, the political background that led to Shakespeare being able to do that? And all three of these research questions share a couple of characteristics. The first is that this is a question that is researchable. So it is realistic for you to be um, able to do research on this question in that you'll be able to find the data and you'll be able to answer the question using the sources that you have available. The second characteristic is that it is debatable. There has to be a question. The question has to have multiple sides to it. If everyone already knows the answer to the question, like, why does an apple fall off the tree? It is not an interesting question anymore. And it, it's not something that people will care enough about. 
read your paper. So make sure that the question you pick is not just feasible, but also debatable and, and there's multiple sites that you can explore. And then finally, also see that it's workable within a timeline. And what that means is asking the question of, does God exist? Or what is the origin of the universe is probably too broad of a question. And so you need to make sure to narrow down the scope of your research question to be about a specific situation or a specific context that you can then realistically explore within the, within the time of your research project. So it needs to be researchable, it needs to be debatable, and it needs to be workable within a timeline. We're going to put some research questions on the screen that are really, really bad. Like I wrote them and reading them makes my eyes bleed. And what I want you guys to do is to say in the chat why you think that's a bad research question. What is it about? May, note down these three criteria and tell me which of these criteria does that research question not fit. This one, I gave you a clue already. So the research question that this student has taken on is what is the origin of the universe? Why is this not a good research question? Scope is too wide, too vague and broad, not workable within the timeline. That's exactly right. So this is a question that tries to take on one of the biggest questions on the planet, which has so many different uh, answers to it, and tries to say, I'm going to answer, answer it in my high school research project. You don't ever want to be taking on a question of this size. If you are interested in the origin of the universe, the next step is to read up about what are some existing theories about the origin of the universe? What do we know and what do we not know? and then narrow down your question to be more specific. So a better research question would be, how does X theory of the origin of the universe, where you talk about a specific theory, deal with the problem of X evidence? So say that there's a new research paper that's out that says the Big Bang theory actually couldn't have happened because of ABC reasons. Saying, I'm going to argue for why the Big Bang theory is a reasonable theory in light of this evidence is a much better and much more narrowly defined research question than one which goes, what is the origin of the universe? Or to say a research question that is around um, how a specific phenomenon in physics, a specific gas, something like that that existed and, and contributed to the origin of the universe is a much clearer and much more specific research question than something that is this broad. So I'm gonna throw in another one and let's see how that sounds to all of you. So the second question, which is also really, really, really bad is, was slavery morally acceptable? You guys have a sense of why it's, it's not debatable. Why is it not debatable? Yep, that's exactly right. Unity says, no, not at all. That's ex exactly right. Slavery is not morally acceptable and everyone knows it's not morally acceptable. So it's not a debatable question. And so picking a question like this might enable you to write some incredible arguments for why slavery wasn't, isn't morally acceptable, but no one cares because it's one of those questions that is pretty settled in the literature. And so, a better way of framing this question might be to say, how was slavery justified in the 18th century in the United States? Or how did people fight against slavery in India in the 19th century? Those are, are much clearer questions, which says we're setting it in a particular country, in a particular time context, and we're going to be investigating a question which actually has an answer that we don't know the exact, um, that, that we don't know already and that we're going to be exploring multiple sides of. So you don't want to take a question that's this obvious. And finally, let's, let's think about this question. What do politicians in Tamil Nadu think about Bitcoin? What might be the problem with this? Anagha says it's extremely random, that's right. It is random, but it could be potentially interesting. But what, what might be the actual problem here? 
you can target people. I think uh, Parv's point of you can't target people is, is not quite right. In fact, it is better for a research question to be specific to a group of people or a geography. Um, the fact that it's not, you can't access the information needed is, is exactly what my problem with this is, which is realistically, I don't think politicians from Tamil Nadu have said much about Bitcoin so far. I don't think we have interviews that they've published about this topic. And you certainly as a high school student are going to find it quite hard to be able to meet them and talk to them about their views on Bitcoin. So given all of that, you might be better off either looking at their opinions on a different topic for which there's information already available online or looking at a different group of people who you could interview. So if you were to say, what do teenagers in India think about Bitcoin? That's a research project you could do because you are, you have access to a number of teenagers in India and, and you can send out a survey or do interviews with them to better understand it and, and write up the research. So this is one of those situations where the information either doesn't exist or you won't be able to easily access it. And so you might wanna rethink your research question a little bit. Great. One question that Kushi asks is, how are the revised topics different from argumentative essays? Shouldn't research papers provide new information to existing knowledge? I'll say there's two ways of writing a research paper, one of which is what's called a systematic review or a literature review, where you take the existing evidence that other people, other professors, other researchers have created, all of the papers that have been published on a particular topic, and then you structure it in a way that, that provides insights into the answer. And so this might feel like just any other argumentative essay, but it's actually really, really important because most people won't be reading a hundred papers on a topic. They'll want to read one paper on a topic that summarizes all of the existing information on it. And so those types of literature review papers are actually really valuable and something that professors often write as well, uh, even at very senior levels. But then the second type of paper are sort of data analysis papers that look at quantitative data, at qualitative data, at experiments, uh, develop new theories and, and try to create a new piece of knowledge that way. And that is also something that's possible. So in the context of the third question, if you were to do a survey or do interviews, that is new knowledge that you are creating. In the second context, which is, um, a philosophical essay, if you're putting forth an argument that other people have not made before, that is absolutely new knowledge that you're creating. So I, I think people think of research as being people in a lab, just mixing chemicals and causing something to explore. And I'd encourage you to think about research in a broader way because writing a systematic literature review or writing a, a theoretical paper is still research, which is super valuable. Awesome. So now that you've got a research question, the research proposal is basically your plan for how to answer your research question. And a research proposal then is really important because it, it helps you understand your topic better. It helps you structure your time for the period of the research. And it also helps you anticipate and avoid roadblocks because if you've got a proposal which says, um, I'm going to be I expect to fall into X and Y holes and, and I wanna overcome them by doing A and B, then that allows you to think ahead and, and deal with those issues before they even arise. And research proposals are also really important because if you're applying for funding, if you're applying to PhDs or master's programs, they often ask for research proposals. So knowing how to write a good proposal is crucial. And a research proposal usually has the following sections. It begins with your research question. And remember, this has to be a clear, concise uh, question, which gets at what it is that you're hoping to study. The second thing that it includes is the academic context. So remember that no one wants to read a paper that just repeats something that another paper has done before. So you need to be able to say, here is what other people have said. And here's what mine adds uniquely. And that could be a new way of structuring the information. It could be a new argument. It could be new evidence that you provide onto the question. So that sort of what, what do we already know and what is my paper going to add that's new to the topic is the second thing that's really important. And the third thing that you then say is, okay, 
So what is my methodology or my approach for answering this question? If I'm going to do an experiment, what are the parameters of the experiment? Who am I going to be interviewing? What is the data that I'm going to be using and how am I planning to analyze the data? So going into real detail on the methods that you plan to use to do your research is, is crucial. And then finally, the research proposal has some logistics like will it cost you money to do this and if so where are you going to get the funding from what's the timeline for this project how when do you expect to do different things and hit different milestones and do you expect to run into any problems along the way and how do you plan to overcome them so that's what a research proposal does and a good research proposal has all of these different aspects within them what we're going to do and i think truly the best way of of uh, of practicing this is we're going to be looking at some suggested proposals that students have sent in to this program. And these are not full scale expanded out research proposals. You can think of these as maybe the first couple of paragraphs of a research proposal or a really summarized research proposal. And I would love, we will once again pause on each of these and I would love to get your feedback on what they've done well and that they haven't done well. Do remember that these are fellow students that have bravely and courageously sent this in so I ask that you be kind and constructive when providing feedback. And of course, I will pick out the ones that I think are fair and, and then it promptly ignore everyone who's being mean. So I'm gonna move into the, the a set of research proposals that we have got from some really good students. And I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on them. So I'll give you guys two minutes to read through this. And I would love for you to use the chat to tell me what works in this and what doesn't. I have a question from Aryan which says, what does academic context in literature review mean? So academic context in literature review means what have other researchers said about this in the past? That's it. What have other professors or experts in the field already discovered about this question? And that's, so that's what the context is. And then you've got to say, what is the new thing that you will add to that? Saad asks, um, is it possible to do research on chemistry without, the lab, without a lab? The answer to that is absolutely. Access to a lab is hard to get for high school students in the best of circumstances and a a pandemic is definitely not the best of circumstances. So it is possible to do research without a lab. And there's probably three types of papers that you could do. The first is you could do research that is a literature review or a systematic review of existing evidence and, and write up a paper that analyzes multiple sides of a debate and talks about why one side is right or that um, summarizes the existing knowledge on a particular topic. The second thing you could do is if there is data or results from experiments available online or that someone else can give you access to, you could write a quantitative analysis paper where you analyze this data and, and report on the findings from that. And then finally, you can do what's called simulations where you can use uh, computer programs to set up the conditions for an experiment online and then artificially run the experiment on your computer and see what the results you might get are and, and what the distribution and, and, and patterns in those results are. So running simulations could also be a way that you do research in chemistry, even without a lab. Awesome. So do people have suggestions for this research proposal? I, I think the, a couple of things that are excellent here is that everyone finds this research proposal super interesting and thinks that it's a really, really cool set of topics that, that are there. But multiple people have pointed out, and I think that's right, that there are two separate ideas in this. And a research question needs to be narrow and specific, which means you can't be writing a research paper that is both about a cooler with mud as well as about exoplanets and theories and physics. So the first step, and I know this is hard, 
as a researcher is to prioritize and pick one thing that you want to focus on. And so I would recommend to this student that you choose one of these two to dive into for research for the research process. The second thing that someone pointed out was that the personal reasons for why students are interested are coming through in this research proposal. And I think having a personal investment in your research project is really valuable because it means that you are able to stay committed and passionate to your work and keep pushing forward. However, when you're writing a research proposal, you would want to be careful to not lean on the personal aspects of it too much because the fact that you want to help underprivileged people or that you want your country to go to a, to a higher level are more strong motivators for you, but it's not clear why a university or a funding body should care about that. And so it would be better to talk about the potential benefits of your research in a more abstract way so that it's not saying I'm doing this because I want to help people, but this research is valuable because it could help X, Y, Z people in these particular ways. So that's just a small change, but I think it's one that is important to think about is how can you present your research proposal in a way that is uh, unbiased and that is objective. And third, I think there is the, there is a point that people have made, which is that um, there are some grammatical errors in this research proposal. And that is so, so important to look up, which is you want to make sure to read and reread through your research proposal multiple times and make sure that in terms of typos, grammatical errors, you crossed all your uh, T's and dotted all your I's because otherwise, even if you're really, really smart, you might come across as unorganized or you might come across as someone who doesn't pay enough attention to detail. And you really don't want that to happen because that can undermine the confidence that other people have in your research. So double check it to make sure you're not spelling two as T-O-O -O when you mean T-O -O, uh, or, or um, when you're writing a sentence, you're making sure that there are commas and semicolons and, and periods as they need to be. So that I think is a useful tip as well. Finally, I would say for both of these topics, it would be useful to go into more detail on how you plan to do this. So developing a cooler with mud is great, but have people formed coolers with, muds be with mud before? If so, what did those prototypes look like? What are the big problems with the existing prototypes? And what is the new thing that you're planning to add? That to go back to what is the academic context and what are you planning to add is really important and something that I think could, could make this research proposal a lot better. Awesome. Thank you to the student who volunteered this proposal. I hope that feedback was useful and good luck with your research. We'll now do a second one. Very different field, economics and business. If you guys could put in chat, what are some things that work well and some things that don't in this research, uh, in this research proposal? Yeah, I, I love the way that some of you have put this, which is, this is a really interesting topic, but there isn't really a question here. I'm not sure if you, if you look through this, what the question is that the person is hoping to study. And I love the way that um, Paul Chaudhry has put it, which, which says, 
it focuses on what is already known rather than what is aimed to be found. So this is a great example of, of, a, of a piece that says, okay, here's the context. Tesla is a business giant. It's owned by Elon Musk. It's used an unusual strategy in the last three years uh, where they have reduced marketing costs and advertising to a bare minimum. Yet the sale of the Tesla car models have stayed constant. That's really useful context. But then you need to have the research question which says, my research question is, what factors have enabled Tesla to successfully adopt a model of zero advertising? And how can it be applied to other car manufacturers in the US? That's a research question which says, here's the context, here's what I'm hoping to study, and here's where it's applicable outside of my own research. So that would, I think, be a big benefit and, and added clarity to this. The second thing that I think is, is, is also here is that, and this comes back to the sort of objective and unbiased nature of research, is you want to avoid sounding too hyperbolic in your research. So a sentence like, the success of the strategy is undeniable, makes you sound like you're a Tesla fanboy, which is totally fine if you are. But in research, you want to come across as being a bit more objective and unbiased. So you might want to say, um, here are some factors which show that this, this strategy has been successful. This strategy has resulted in um, sales, in higher sales of, the te of Teslas than any other car in 2020 in the US. That's an objective fact-based statement saying this strategy has been massively successful is more of sort of a, an emotionally uh, charged statement that you're making about it, which sounds less neutral. So I think those are the two big ones. One is making sure to sound neutral. The second one is to be sure to have a question and not just a, a bunch of things that you're saying about a particular topic. Um, so thank you guys for sharing that. I want to look at one last one before we break out into our rooms. And hopefully you, you're finding this useful as a way to identify what's missing in research proposals and ensuring that you can then have them when you write your own. Does anyone have suggestions for this? Too broad. Topic is already researched upon. Well structured, but hard to research. Yeah, let me start with that. I think the, I think it is structured really well, which is it's got a clear title. It's setting out the objectives, which are the structure of the research. And then finally it says, why is this research relevant or important? So I think that's fair, but I do agree with the two things that other people have said. The first one being that it is too broad. I'm actually not sure what exactly you're referring to when you say similarities between the human body and the universe. Um, are you talking about the kinds of material that the human body is made of and the material that the universe is made of? Are you talking about how quickly uh, the human body expands and, and how the universe expands? Are you talking about um, the, the mechanical aspects of it? So it's, it's a really, really broad topic which could do with a lot more clarity and, and narrowing down. And the second thing is, part of it is on the questions that you've asked. The other is about how you want to answer those questions, which is a couple of people have said, you're using varying fields, making it difficult to research. It's a mix of bio and physics and chemistry, all different topics. And um, one more person said, clarification in terms of the possible areas of research would be useful. And that's right, which is any good research proposal has to say, what's your question? And then how are you planning to answer it? So 
in the previous one you might they might have wanted to say through interviews with car manufacturers in the us i will answer this question or by analyzing the um, financial statements of major car manufacturers, I will answer this question. Similarly in this, since it's a topic that could use biological methods or physical methods or chemistry methods, you might want to be clearer about what, how are you planning to answer this question? What data are you looking at? How do you plan to analyze the data? What types of tools are you planning to use to answer this question? And so that's why that part of the research proposal is also really, really important. So to so to um, summarize then, you've got to have a research topic that is clear. So think harder to say, if you're saying similarities between the human body and the universe, are you saying similarities in a particular area? For example, as, as Riti says in the comments, what she meant was the structures and shapes of the human body and, and how there are shapes and structures a, a, in the universe that, that exist. So being very clear in your research question and being specific, is important. The second thing you then want to do is answer how you plan to answer that research question. So what methods are you going to use? The third is what is the academic context that already exists and what is the new thing that you're adding? And then finally, the logistics of it. What's the timeline? What's the, um, the, the sources of funding and so on? And what issues that might you run into? That then is a strong research proposal that you put together. And the steps after that unfold pretty clearly from there. You've got your research question, you've got your proposal, and then you carry out the literature, the research and write your paper. And, and that then is how you get to the end of the finish line. So that's what research looks like. I'm going to pause here because this was a very general and broad overview of what a research question and a research proposal are. And I will pass it over to Devesh because he will then introduce the folks will be walking you through research in specific disciplines and telling you a bit more about their research in the breakout rooms. Um, so passing it over to you, Devish, to, to for the next steps. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dhruva, for uh, taking us through the whole process of uh, uh, going through these research proposals. And I'm sure the students who send these proposals uh, benefited tremendously. Uh, with that, we are now ready uh, to start off with the breakout rooms, the topic specific breakout rooms. And uh, we have all of our uh, researchers and panelists who are here. I can see Lee uh, has just joined, so it's great to see you. Uh, and before we get going, let me tell you that there are going to be eight breakout rooms today. Um, and I'll just name the breakout rooms and then I'll uh, introduce the speakers for the breakout rooms. And then uh, within a few moments, we'll open up the breakout rooms so that you can join those rooms and listen to all these fantastic speakers as they share their research with you. So uh, room number one is uh, on environment and sustainability and that's uh, the speaker for that room is Avni Watts. Avni is a grade 12 student at, she's an IB diploma student at Cathedral and John Collins School in Mumbai. She's passionate about physics and economics and she's conducted research on urban disaster management and the inclusion of informal workers alongside her mentor, Haley. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here, Avni. Thank you for joining. The second uh, uh, student, second researcher uh, who has joined us uh, is uh, for computer science and data science, Shreyas Sridhara. Shreyas Sridhara is also an IB student in his senior year at Stonehill International School in Bangalore. He enjoys using statistical analysis to analyze the analyze and extract practical information from large scale data and hopes to major in computer science at college. Uh, thank you, Shreyas, for joining. Researcher number three, we have Carrie Casarotti. Uh, she's, uh, she's going to talk, us, uh, talk with, uh, with us about physics and astrophysics. Uh, Carrie uh, is, uh, did her undergraduate at Cornell from 2013 to 2016. During this time, she worked primarily with Professor Jim Alexander and Professor Maxim uh, to, on prospects of a proposed beam on target experiment. After graduation, she, she received a scholarship to work on a NA2, NA62 experiment at CERN, uh, CERN, from January to August 2017. In the fall of 2017, she began her PhD in high energy phenomenology at 
Howard under Professor Matris. Uh, thank you, Carrie, for joining us today. Our researcher number four is our own Dhruva Bhatt. Uh, Dhruva is the director of, uh, he's going to talk about economics. He's the director of Lumia Research Scholar Program and a PhD candidate at Oxford's Department of International Development. Before this, he graduated from Harvard with an undergraduate degree in economics and from Oxford with an MPhil in development studies as a Rhodes Scholar. Welcome, Dhruva. Uh, joining us uh, for law is Vanshat Jain. Uh, through his time at National Law School, Vanshat has developed a particular interest, interest in international law. The inequity that persists in international law disturbs him deeply, and he hopes to work towards creating a fairer system for all states. At Oxford, Vanshat will focus on international criminal law. His work with the Legal Services Clinic at NLS to promote legal literacy and increase access to the law. Vanshaj is a passionate mooter and has represented India at the Jessup Moot. Uh, in 2016, he argued the, the finals of the ICC Moot before sitting judges of the International Criminal Court at, at the Hague. His other interests include theater and long distance running. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here, Vanshaj. Then we have four professors joining us today. Uh, Professor Lee Shan, uh, Dr. Lee Shan uh, is going to discuss with you about marketing. See if you're on mute. Have I been on mute the whole time? No. Only, okay. only when you started speaking about Dr. Shan. Oh, okay. Okay. Wow. Okay. So, uh, Professor Lee Shan teaches marketing and management in both undergraduate and postgraduate programs at Juniata College. She re received her, I'm sorry, she received her PhD in international business uh, and master's of science in marketing from Southern New Hampshire University, along with the certificate of business analysis from data to insight from the Wharton School in the University of Pennsylvania and a certificate of essentials in fashion from the Parsons Schools of Design. Being a member of the Academy of International Business, Dr. Shan has been teaching international seminar of the graduate program at uh, Kedge Business School for three years. I taught international business in Quinnipiac University as a visiting professor and has taught international business in Penn State University for three years. With the consulting experience in a Chinese top-notch fintech company, The Golden, uh, Dr. Shan has supervised nine undergraduate students uh, from nine different uh, nationalities in Beijing, China. Uh, she has presented in numerous conferences as the annual conference, uh, such as the annual conference held by the Academic of International Business. It's a pleasure to have you here, Professor Shen. Uh, we have Professor Regina Lavendela, uh, who is going to talk with us about uh, pre-med and healthcare majors. Uh, uh, Regina uh, is also a faculty at uh, Juniata College, Pennsylvania, and she's an assistant professor of biology. She comes from Juniata from a postdoctoral fellowship at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory in Berkeley, California. She earned a bachelor's degree in 2014, uh, 2004 from Lafayette College in Easton. And then she went on to earn two master's degree from University of Cincinnati, one in environment science and the second one in molecular genetics. She also earned a doctoral degree uh, uh, from in environment science from University of Cincinnati. Her research focuses on methods to design and implement novel uh, molecular based detection methods to track sources of fecal contamination in the environment. She also has research molecular uh, microbial ecology approaches to better understand the role of microbes in human health and the environment. She has overseen graduate research and has taught a wide variety of bio and ecology courses. She received the 2011 Science and Technology Achievement Award from the Environment Protection Agency, and the Spot Recognition Award for exceptional research contribution from Lawrence National University. Her research interests have been published in scholarly journals like MC Micro, Microbiology, Microbiology, the research ISME Journal Applied and Environmental Microbiology Journal of the Environment Science and so on. 
It's a pleasure to have you here, Professor uh, Regina. And finally, we have two more professors who are going to just talk about engineering. We have Professor Narayan Kutirumal, who is a physics professor and is currently chairing the Department of Physics and Astronomy at College of Charleston. And he is interested in uh, talking about uh, materials. He's, he's an expert of materials. Uh, and he's also directing the engineering pro program at College of Charleston. And the second speaker in the engineering uh, breakout room will be uh, uh, Funke Olidameji, who is an instructor of the physics department and she teaches systems engineering courses at College of Charleston. Well, that takes care of all the presenters and of all the researchers who are going to be here and who are going to share their research with you. With that, we had just opened the breakout rooms and uh, you will be able to select the breakout room that you want to join. That, that, that is also true for all the presenters. Uh, you will be able to select the breakout room that you would like to join. And once in the breakout room, uh, you will see that the researchers will present their research and they'll take you through a presentation. And towards the end, they will uh, take some Q&A. So we have roughly 40 to 45 minutes for this uh, breakout room. Towards the end, uh, uh, feel free to come back and we'll share a resource with you. Uh, we have a, a, a giveaway. We have a giveaway for all of you, and uh, yeah, with that, I think we are open to breakout to, uh, to open the breakout rooms. Uh, thank you for joining.